class. Today we are talking about the philosophy of evil. And so we're referring to John Hicks' chapter on the problem of evil from his 1983 book, The Philosophy of Religion. And Hick was a British-born uh, philosopher and educated while and educated in Great Britain while spending most of his life teaching in the United States uh, with such Ivy League, school, Ivy League schools as Cornell, Princeton, Theological Seminary, and so forth. And so obviously we'll look at the notion of evil by way of an ethical perspective while also looking at the notion of evil from a theological perspective. And really, in a way, too, we need to recognize that um, the perspective of evil as far as our study of ethics is concerned is related to what we're um, thinking of as meta-ethics. So really, to study evil is really also to study a uh, way in which we're understanding ethics at the meta level. Um, and also from a religious standpoint. And so our initial understanding of evil is clearly related to the discipline of philosophy held within the practice um, itself in that the study of evil is also a way in which we're understanding religious belief at the same time. And so Hicks' account is not... Um, is notably Christian, i.e. having to do with the study and examination of evil within the context of a Christian God in relation to believers. And also, too, one thing to keep in mind is that the way in which we're understanding Hicks' notion of evil also has secular relevance. And what I'll do is work on pointing out the secular connections as we proceed. And so the study of evil is, as I pointed out, meta-ethical in that we look at the relationship between God and evil. And Hicks' overall position is defined and considered with the use of the technical term theosity. So essentially the word theosity is to justify the existence of suffering and while at the same time accounting for an all-knowing, all-powerful, benevolent God. So in other words, the way in which we're understanding theosity is related to human suffering in the sense that um, someone who is presenting an argument in terms of theosity is doing so in uh, response to an argument that um, God must not exist if all this evil suffering and death is allowed in the universe, okay? So a theosity is a justification for God's existence in the face of these problems of suffering, so on and so forth. And so we need to uh, put a finer point, point on Hick's theosity um, in terms of his specific type of theosity as Arrhenian theosity, of which we'll examine a little more precisely in a bit. So that's not to be mistaken for Iranian, but I'll um, offer some more specifics on how that uh, theosity is understood. And so meanwhile, we'll follow with Hicks, Hicks' initial definition of evil, as a reference to physical pain, mental suffering, and moral wickedness. Um, and in a way, too, we also need to acknowledge that this understanding of evil is also uh, by way of having a specific human origin, okay? So the, the um, point there to be taken is that evil doesn't exist outside of human free will. And so uh, such evil is also the grounding to and the going beyond 
recognizable problems such as poverty, oppression, persecution, war, also injustice, indignity, and inequity. And yet at the same time, we also need to recognize that all pain and suffering is not always human caused as well. So we also need to see things that we identify as evil as having natural causes. And this is not to be confused with the way in which we're addressing evil in this case. And so um, these natural causes that are also thought to um, be evil, as with um, disease, earthquakes, floods, um, drought, fires, etc. And so also know that uh, theosity is an answer to this problem. So Hicks pointing out that when we're thinking of this specific term theosity, we're seeing it as an answer to a problem or an answer to the argument that, quote, if God is perfectly loving, God must wish to abolish all evil. And if God is all powerful, God must be able to abolish all evil, but evil still exists. So therefore, God cannot be both omnipotent and perfectly good. And so you want to frame this from the perspective of a non-believer. So in other words, it's a theosity is an answer to the challenge that we just laid forth there. God is perfectly loving. God must wish to abolish all evil. And if God is all powerful, God must be able to abolish all evil, etc. But yet evil still exists. So therefore, for the non-believer or the atheist, the idea is that therefore God must not exist if such things are uh, persisting. Um, and so essentially, Hick is offering a theosity. And a theosity is a way that we're thinking of a defense of Christianity with the notion of the idea that evil or the notion of evil or the existence of evil does not contradict an omnipotent and perfect God. And so Hick immediately discounts the Christian scientists who uh, might have the idea that evil is merely an illusion, given um, that the thought um, that throughout biblical and even secular history in general, there's all manner of pain and suffering that's accounted for in relation to our basic experience here on Earth. So in other words, evil cannot be an illusion. And I think the justification there for the Christian scientist is really that evil cannot, or evil can just be an illusion in the sense that if you're aiming towards the good, you are not practicing evil. And as a result, any type of evil, evil that we could imagine is really a deviation from how it is that we're understanding what's good. And so therefore, it's just merely an illusion to the Christian scientists. And I think that's a little bit of the justification. Um, and then so Hick lays out three Christian responses or defenses or theosities that justify the existence of evil along with the existence of God. So first we have the um, uh, Augustinian response um, a, or the Augustinian theosity and then there's the Arrhenian theosity or the uh, Arrhenian response and then there's the theosity or the response by way of modern process theory. And we are not going to be looking at this process um, uh, theology. We're just going to be looking at the Augustinian response and the Arrhenian response. And so before looking at the three theosities, one point that's common among all three is centered around the common understanding of free will, okay, um, slash freedom, okay. And this is incredibly important to recognize with regard to how it is that we're understanding evil.
because the existence of evil is made possible by the way in which we're understanding human freedom as well. And this is um, something that should um, uh, impress upon you the importance of understanding the relevance of freedom because nine times out of 10, or most of the time, we usually think that freedom is always a good thing or freedom is always uh, amoral or likewise um, a positive way in which we're understanding ourselves in terms of human action. But we forget often that the way in which we're understanding um, immorality slash evil is also by way of human freedom, right? So like for example, the criminal often wants to be free to be immoral, to perform his or her criminal acts. And so we need to have that point as one of the um, foundations for how it is that we're understanding evil. And then also to discount the common opinion that freedom is always this wonderful, feel good um, way in which we're understanding ourselves in general. So that's probably one of the most intriguing parts of this um, philosophical understanding of evil. And so this is somewhat contrary to the common opinion of Christianity, of which does not account for the free will of individuals. And so what I mean by that is oftentimes when we're understanding um, Christianity, we could also be of the mind that um, God is deterministic and um, or predeterministic in the sense that God has a plan for all of us, that sort of thing. And what we need to recognize is that um, uh, deeper theological study shows us that um, there is an accounting for um, the way in which we're understanding our relationship with God, where God is allowing of our own free will apart from any deterministic factors. So, so we're also sweeping away that problem of common opinion, and we need to come to grips with that too. In other words, a deterministic view of God, whereby God controls deterministically our fate and so forth. So in other words, um, our relationship in terms of God, it, um, we might think is fated to be a certain way, but we need to recognize that that's not always the case, and that's certainly not the case in which Hick is understanding Christianity, and likewise the way in which we're understanding the Augustinian and Arrhenian theosities. So Hick is pointing out that all three theosities, or all three positions, are a way to recognize free will as a way to justify a case for evil in the world. So in other words, the existence of evil has to do or is inextricably linked with the way in which we're understanding our own free will. And that's also in tandem with how it is that we're understanding our relationship to God as well. And also our relationship to pain, suffering, along with a belief of God or a belief in God. And so for Hick, Christian thinkers have frequently aligned with the notion that moral evil and our freedom slash moral responsibility are bound together. Okay, And so, and also too, immorality and freedom are bound together as well, obviously. And so we are freely responsible for our actions, our choices, so on and so forth. And that is that God then must have created us with the freedom to do good and likewise with the freedom to do evil. So in this framework, we are free to make mistakes, including choosing evil. And not doing good things is a contradiction to God's goodness. And so a dissenting opinion here might be in the form of a question, quote, why wouldn't God simply create people who are only freely capable of perfect goodness, unquote? Yet the obvious problem is that in um, the word, is in the word free. That is, 
if we're proposing that God's predestination for us is that we could be free to act rightly and perfectly all the time, then such actions would not be wholly free. So in other words, if we were predetermined to always act in a perfect way, then the suggestion would be a way in which we are not understanding ourselves in terms of freedom. Given that such actions are obviously not free in the fullest sense of the word, so this is freedom with conditions, right? In other words, the condition that we always act toward goodness or we always act perfectly. So in other words, if you're destined to freedom, you're simply not free. This is not freedom. So we need to understand that there's that philosophical problem that's part of that um, addressing that issue. Why is it that God wouldn't create us to be perfectly good to begin with? And so Hick then moves to the theosity of St. Augustine, or you might uh, pronounce his name St. Augustine, St. Augustine, St. Augustine. Um, and he's otherwise known as um, Augustine of Hippo, who was born in 354 and dies in 430 AD. And so his theosity looks a lot like St. Thomas Aquinas um, and also Aristotle's, whereby we have an account of evil by way of the word privation. In other words, evil is an absence or a breakdown or the going wrong of goodness, the falling away from goodness. A privation of um, goodness is a falling away from goodness um, or a lacking of goodness. And so for Augustine, God created us to do good and to live good lives, to do good for others, etc. Yet due to elements like free will, um, simple pain, and or a natural breakdown of evil is a deviation from the good. In other words, evil is a breakdown of, a, of our moral functioning toward goodness. Because remember, in the context of St. Thomas Aquinas, or likewise Aristotle, and extending to Augustine, the way in which we're understanding ourselves morally is in terms of always aiming toward goodness. And when we fall away from that, that's how it is that we could account for goodness. Or likewise, when we're just simply negligent of being good. So in other words, when we're not being good, we also could potentially swerve into problems of being evil by default. And so one way we could think about this is the idea that Adam and Eve fell away from good and they failed to be perfectly good. And here, the birth of sin, here is what we identify for Christians as the birth of sin, as a practice of evil away from the good. So that's a way to identify this notion of a privation of goodness um, in terms of the fall of Adam and Eve. And so um, evil then is our responsibility, not God's. 